How are you? Good. You good? All right. Are you ready? Get your Bibles, get your apps downloaded, turn to the lots of scripture today. The people of God have always had the word of God. God God has always spoken. And you go, well, he's never spoken to me. Well, have you ever talked to him about something he's interested in? Just an idea. You ever talked to him about what he wants to talk about? So the people of God have always had the word of God. And what Jesus does in John chapter 14 and John chapter 16 is he introduces that the people of God can have the spirit of God. That was brand new. The spirit was outside, kind of mystical, kind of, kind of you know, uh, ethereal in some ways, but it wasn't like tangent, personal inside of you. And so now Jesus introduces that people can have not only the word of God, but the spirit of God. You have observed over your lifetime people who maybe have not got this balance exactly right. You've seen people maybe over here on the word of God, just word of God, big black Bibles, beat you over the head with them, make you feel guilty. You walk out of church feeling like, oh, I'm such a sinner. Anybody feel that way? Like you've been baptized in lemon juice or something, right? So, so you know the over here, but then you see the other side, the other pendulum swings over here with the Spirit of God, and you're going, those are some kooky people. Those are like some really weird people out there. They're, they're out there somewhere. And so when I was in graduate school a long time ago, there was an old-timer, uh, he was dead when I read his book, but there's an old timer named Vance Havner. And Vance Havner said something I will never forget. He said, If you have only the Word of God, you dry up. If you have only the Spirit of God, you blow up. But if you have both, you grow up. Now let's see if you can do that with me. If you have only the Word of God, you dry up. If you have only the Spirit of God, you blow up, but if you have both, you, you grow up. And, and I think that's where we want to be. We want to have this balance. It's like two rails that a rail car has to go on. You take away one of those rails, the car is going to topple over, right? So we've got the Word of God and we've got the Spirit of God. Today, we're, we're in a kind of a little mini-series about the Spirit of God, and we'll land back in life in the Spirit in Romans chapter 8. Romans 8 is the magnum opus of about life in the spirit. So let me start with Jesus. It's always a good place to start. Would you agree with that? Let me start with Jesus. And Jesus is about to leave. He's about to go to the cross. He's about to be uh, betrayed, handed over. And he's telling the, the guys, it's going to be fine because the spirit is coming. And the spirit will come and come inside of you. He'll guide you. He'll help you. Everything's going to be even better, and they are freaking out. So here's John chapter 16. He just tells them all this, and they're filled with grief because he said, I'm going to go away, I'm going to the cross. But very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world wrong. He'll prove the world to be in the wrong about sin, righteousness, and ju judgment. Now, don't get lost here if you're new in church. About sin, because the Spirit's going to help people become Christians. Because people need to be convicted. They need to know that I'm real. About me, because they don't believe in me. The Spirit's going to help about righteousness. The Spirit will help define. It will help describe what righteousness looks like and what righteousness is. Because I'm going to the Father where you can see me no longer. And about judgment, because I got the prince of the world condemned. He's in my crosshairs. I'm going to pull the trigger on him. He's going down. He's going down. The Spirit's coming, and the enemy's going down. I have so much more to say to you, but you can't handle it right now, because this is like a new concept to you, and you're not really aware of what I'm trying to communicate. But when he comes, the Spirit of truth, he's going to guide you. He will guide you into how much truth? That's amazing. What that verse claims is he can guide you on when to buy, when to sell. He can guide you on who to date, who not to date. I shouldn't text her back. I should call her back. He will guide you into all truth. He will guide you. The spirit of truth will guide you to make incredible relationship, job, business decisions in your life. He will guide you in all truth. 
and he will not speak on his own. Now, I love this because the Spirit and the Word of God always complement each other. If you think that you're being led to do something outside of the Word of God, you've missed it. Because the Spirit will never contradict the Word of God. The Spirit always complements the Word of God. So if you're being led like to sexual immorality, you've missed it. If you're being led to betray, you've missed it. You've been led to lie, you've missed it. The Spirit of God will never lead you outside of the Word of God. He will not speak on his own. He will only speak what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. Now, that's an incredible promise. What is yet to come? You get this feeling, you get this sense inside of your human spirit, oh, I probably shouldn't do that. Here's what's about to happen. Or I should do this. Here's about what's to happen. He will tell you what is yet to come. What an advantage you have in business. What an advantage you have at the board table. What an advantage you have making purchasing decisions. He will tell you what is yet to come if we're dialed in. And we're coming to the big if in just a couple of minutes. He will glorify me, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. The Word of God, the Spirit of God, and the Father of God are always glorifying each other. They're not in conflict. They're not in competition. They're in unity. And He will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what He will make known to you. Now, I love this because the Spirit of God is going to come, going to come, going to come. And now we go forward about 40 days. So Jesus dies and it was Passover, and before Pentecost, Pentecost is 50, 50 days from Passover, that's when the Holy Spirit will come, dial back 10 days. We're now 10 days before we know the other part of the story. It's 10 days before the Holy Spirit comes. So it's about the 40th day now of post-resurrection appearances, and here's what he says. We don't know who Theophilus is. There have been books written about him. I don't know. You don't know. Nobody knows. Who cares? Luke's writing this. Maybe Luke cares, but I, I don't care. I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up into heaven. After giving instruction through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days. Now again, if you're new to church, that's a big, that's a big bold statement. Jesus made 40 days of post-resurrection appearances. Here he is walking through Jerusalem. Here he is going through the town. Jesus is making post-resurrection appearances. Turn to your neighbor and say, that's a big deal. That's a big deal. Turn to your other neighbor and say, did you get it? That's a really big deal. It's a huge deal. And he spoke about what? The kingdom of God. Now, this is where we're headed in just a minute. He's given you the Holy Spirit, but it's not just for you. Remember his prayer on earth as it is in heaven? Remember what happened at his baptism? The heavens were torn open, and the Spirit now came down and remained on him in the form of a dove. There's now kingdom work. So he's given you the Spirit, but it's not just for you. There's some other purposes that he has in mind. The kingdom of God. Now, they're going to talk about their earthly kingdom. They're going to talk about some other things. So on one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised. This is what he was talking about in John 16. This is what he was talking about in John chapter 14. There was the gift of the Holy Spirit that was coming, which you've heard me speak about. Yep, he talked about it a lot. For John baptized with water, we know that, but in a few days he'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. We can't wait for that. Ten days later is when the Holy Spirit's going to come. But He's talking about the kingdom of God. They're still talking about an earthly kingdom. They're still talking about all the Romans who are everywhere in the city. And when are we going to be free as, as a Jewish nation? Then they gathered around him and they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And if I were Jesus, I'd be going, oh, man, this is hopeless. This is so hopeless. Do you not get it? We're not talking about Israel's kingdom. I didn't come for a military coup. That's what happened to Judas. 
Judas got all lost in this because Judas was a zealot and Judas was so disappointed in Jesus because Judas was wanting Jesus to have a military coup and rout the Romans. He didn't come for a military coup. He came for a spiritual revolution. That's why Jesus came. And so Jesus politely says, guys, it's not for you to know the times and dates the Father is set by his own authority. But here's my point. This is the whole deal. You're going to receive power. You're going to receive power. Remember the spirit I was talking about in John 14, John 16? You're going to receive power. You're going to receive power. You're going to receive power. And the spirit's going to come on you. And he's going to come on you to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and all, all over the world. And after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hit him from their sight. They were looking intently up in the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here? Looking in the sky, the same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Here's the question. Why, why are you guys standing here? Jesus just ascended, and you know that there's going to be kingdom work that's going to take place. All right. So we're on a journey together. We're going down the highway. For just a second, I want to get off the highway and go to a rest area. Bless you. You need to go to the bathroom for the rest area. So we're at the rest area. We're right there. So hang with me for just a second at the rest area. God promises to give you his Holy Spirit for you, but it's not only for you. I want you to flip this around this morning. We're in such a consumer culture. We think everything's for us. And he's given you the Holy Spirit to guide you, to equip you, to help you, to lead you, to give you the ability to make really good decisions. But he's given you this power so you can now go into the world, your world, your context, your community. He's given you power that's supernatural. He's really made you a superhero in your family. My family's dark. It doesn't matter. You're the light. My work is dark. It doesn't matter. You're the light. My neighborhood is dark. It doesn't matter. You're the light. I will give you supernatural power, and you will change the environment. So, yes, he's given us the Spirit. And, yes, it's so cool that we have it inside of us, but it's not just for you. God has something he wants from you. He wants you to be his hands and his feet and his mouthpiece. He wants you to be his servant wherever he leads you to go. All right, we're out of the rest area. We're back on the highway now, and let's, let's keep moving. I wanted to share this little passage with you because they're getting ready to cast lots to replace Judas. And why do they cast lots? Because they're still a couple of days away from the Holy Spirit coming. And they're still kind of like spiritually guessing on what to do and what not to do. But when the Holy Spirit comes and it came and it lived inside of them and remained on them, they were no longer spiritually guessing. But here's a story. They're going to replace Judas. And there were two qualifications. Number one, you had to be a part of the whole team since John Bapti John's baptism. And number two, you had to be an eyewitness of the resurrection. Because times are going to be so challenging. We're all going to be tortured. We're all pretty much going to die except John. We're all going to die. And so you had better really know that you know that you know that you saw Jesus rise from the dead. And so here's that story. I just like the story. Nobody ever teaches on it. I just think it's cool. Therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time, the Lord Jesus was living among us, beginning with John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they nominated two men. Joseph called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take the, over the apostolic ministry. In other words, who will become number 12? We were 12. We lost Judas. Now we're going to be 12 again. And uh, Judas left to go to the place where he belongs. That was a polite way of saying that, wasn't it? <laughs> That's pretty funny, really. It's where Judas belonged, to hell. All right, anyway. Then they cast lots. They cast lots? They cast lots. Because the Holy Spirit hasn't come yet. And the lots then fell to Matthias, and so he was added to the 11. All right. So 
10 days now go by, and it's Acts chapter 2 is the story, and it's called the day of Pentecost. Again, it's 50 days from Passover. It's this major Jewish feast, and 120 people are up in this huge house, upper room. And the Holy Spirit comes, and man, the place was just unbelievable. There was power, 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 power. And right after that, then, Peter goes outside, and he's filled with the Holy Spirit. The guy that was a coward is now going to have courage. The guy that was, you know, cussing in front of a middle school girl that he didn't even know who Jesus was is now standing and almost spitting on Caiaphas and on Annas, on Pontius Pilate, on the crowds. The crowds who shouted, crucify, crucify. Peter now stands up. How did he get that power? The Holy Spirit came upon him. 3,000 people at that moment became Christians and got baptized on the same day. And now the church is beginning to be synergistic. There is unity. They are marching forward, and they will become his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and they begin to go to the ends of the earth. And, And people are getting healed. Demons are getting driven out of people. Uh... Lame man, Peter and John, heal a lame man. Silver and gold I don't have, but what I do have in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I get, stand up and walk. This lame guy stands up and walks. And, and Peter and John then get thrown into prison, and they have a prayer meeting. And the prayer meeting was like, like one that most have never been experienced before. So they get released from prison, and they go back to their own people, and they report all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And the chief priests and elders said, do not proclaim that Jesus rose from the dead. Don't be talking about the resurrection. And what do they do? They tell everybody about the resurrection. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and everything in them. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in the city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. This is their prayer. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats. I like that. Consider what's going on. We're not oblivious to the problem. We're keenly aware that we've got a really difficult situation. Consider their threats. But enable us to speak with great boldness. We're aware of what they told us. We're aware they're trying to squelch this. We're aware. But give us boldness to speak your word. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. That's called a prayer meeting right there. That's a good prayer meeting. If the ground is shaking during a prayer meeting. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God so boldly. We landed on this verse last week and we're going to land on it again today in about 10 more minutes. And now we're going to go to Romans chapter 8. And we're going to look at about eight different pieces to this that he's trying to help us to understand life in the Spirit. We did four or five last week. We're going to try to cram in eight this morning. But that's that's a verse you need to embrace. See, the Holy Spirit comes to join your human spirit. The Holy Spirit comes to alongside of you. The Holy Spirit comes to affirm that you are God's children. And God has a plan for you. And God has a vision for you. And God has direction for you. And God has environments and cultures and places that he wants you to be able to live for him and be able to live with him. He wants his spirit to be able to live through you. That's what he gets excited about. So let's talk about this. Again, if you're like new to church, this would be like the Bible study. Everything we just talked about was like the appetizer, okay? Just the warm-up. So he wants to make sure that everybody understands the sinful nature. He wants to make sure that you understand that People do bad things because they don't have the Spirit of God. People continue to make really poor decisions because they're not led by the Spirit of God. He just wants you to understand that people who don't have the Spirit of God don't understand why you do what you do. They don't understand why you give, serve, pray. How could you forgive? How could you love? People without the Spirit don't understand what you understand. So he says, the mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. It just can't. Those that are not controlled by the Spirit just can't understand godly things. It's beyond their grasp. 
Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. Have you ever wondered why some people in your family just keep making poor decisions and you can see it and you're just pleading and begging that they'll change their course and you're going, oh my gosh, how, how do they not see this? Because the Spirit has revealed it to you and the Spirit's made it clear to you and you can see what is yet to come and you can see things that nobody else can. The Spirit of truth is revealing to you. Well, he gives us encouragement for this difficult journey because life is tough. He just wants everybody to know, I'm, I'm, I'm in. I, I'm, I'm, I know what you're going through. So it says, you, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but you're in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they don't belong to Christ. So, so if you're not a Christian, you don't have the Spirit. If you are a believer, you have God's Spirit. Now, that doesn't mean it's active. That doesn't mean you're using it. That doesn't mean you're living by it, but you have it. You have access to it. We'll come to that in just a minute. And he wants you to know that the Spirit of God lives in you. That is so new. God used to live in a tabernacle. God used to live in a tent. He now lives in every believer. That should blow you away. He now lives in every person who has accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior and as their Lord. That is just amazing. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life. The Spirit gives life. The Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And then he's talking about this, you know, future. He just wants you to know that he kind of throws this in. He's talking about the present. He's talking about your life today. But he wants to throw in the future. It's not just now, but it's, he wants you to know you're going to get a new body. Maybe your body doesn't feel good today. Maybe your body's not doing great today. He's wanting you to know there's hope, there's hope, there's hope. You will have a new body. That's really good news, isn't it? That's great news. He says this, And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his Spirit who lives in you. That's, that's kind of his pitch here. you got the Spirit inside of you. Now, this next one's a little bit funny and odd, but you can sin but you're not under any obligation to sin. I, we talked about this last week. I had four or five great conversations with people this week about this. I hear believers say, well, I just sin, I sin, I sin, you sin, everybody sins. I want to say this really carefully. It's not normal to sin. It's not normal. If you've got the Spirit living in you, I didn't say you didn't have the capacity, but it's not, it's not normal. If the same Spirit who raised Jesus Christ from the dead is living in you, you don't have to sin, but, but it doesn't mean you don't have the capacity uh, to sin. So let me tell a story about myself which shows a little sin. I just, we just gotten off the boat. I was hungry, I was hot, I was tired. Yes, I'm justifying what I, what I did. Uh, hungry, hot, tired, going to my favorite pizza place. And the last two times I've been in there, the pizza menu changed and they messed it all up. And they, you know, they had a sanctified pizza and now they got pizza from hell. But anyway, so, so I, I go in there and um, the proprietor's behind the, the counter and I said, hey, you know, you're taking this off the menu. Do you have this? And he said, no. And he said something kind of sharp. Did I mention I was hungry, hot, and tired? <laughs> I, just, I just want to make that clear. And I, and I said something, I, I upped the ante. I said something sharp right back to him. Well, he wasn't going to have that. And he, he trumped me. He went higher, and the gloves are off at the pizza place. Now, if you're a first-time guest, <laughs> I just want you to know, we have some really holy pastors on our staff. I may not fit in that category, but we got some great pastors. So I left, and I'm fired up, and I get back in the car, and I'm trying to, you know, have Danita not notice this. And she said, where's the pizza? Why are you back so early? Oh, it just didn't work out. Now, you've been married for 33 years. She can read your mail. I mean, you, you know, so 
all right, tell me what happened. And I'm thinking, do I have to? So I tell her what happened and, you know, the words and, you know, the gloves were off. And she said, just shaking her head, and she said, what are you going to do if he comes to church? I said, honey, this guy doesn't go to church. I don't have to worry about that. She said, well, what if he finds out you're a preacher or you're a minister? Oh, that's a really good question. I said, well, I'm going to tell him I'm Willie Rice. I'm the pastor of Calvary Baptist Church. That's what I'll tell him. And see, Willie and I have talked about this twice, and we have given each other permission to use each other in extreme emergencies. And not the counter, but in the car with Danita. This was an extreme emergency, all right? I, I, it's not normal to sin. I sinned. I did. It's not normal, though. It's not something you have to do. Here's what he says. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it's not to the flesh to live according to it. You don't have to sin. It's just, it's just not normal for a believer to sin. Another observation is living by the Spirit gives you life. This is what he's trying to teach us. There's life. Every time you have stepped outside the will of God, how did you feel? You didn't feel good. You got the Holy Spirit going ding, 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 ding inside of you. Every time you step. But every time you're in the center of the fairway, every time you know that you've done exactly what God's called you to do, you feel great. You feel good, don't you? Because you're in the Father's will. Well, if you live by, according to the flesh, you'll die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you're, you're going to live. And so there's some deeds of the body that need to be put to death. I, I need to put this to death. I need to put this to death. This needs to die. This needs to go. This needs to be buried. Don't raise this up. This needs to be down there deep. Bury this sucker deep. It needs to go there. There's some things in you, some things in me that need to be buried. And then he says, for those of you who are led by the Spirit of God, you are, you are children of God. That's exactly right. We're the children of God. Another observation says you can live free from fear. You know what the number one command in the Bible is? Fear not. Do not fear. The number one command in all of Scripture is do not fear. They weren't afraid of of death. And some of you are afraid to tithe. They weren't afraid of being tortured. And, and, and some of you are afraid to get baptized. They, they weren't afraid of boldly proclaiming. And so he says, fear not. We don't have to live under a spirit of fear. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. And his spirit will encapsulate your human spirit. That's really what he's trying to say here. It will encapsulate. Imagine you're the only adult and you're watching a two-year-old. It's your kid. It's your neighbor's kid. It's your grandson, your granddaughter. You're watching a two-year-old. And a mountain lion comes out of the woods. Comes out of the woods. You're like watching the kid maybe by the pool. And here comes the mountain lion. You're in California. You're somewhere. And all of a sudden, what are you going to do? Are you going to say to the two-year-old, hey, honey, come here. I want you to come with me. And you go, I got just enough time to get in the house, pick the kid up, get in the house. Are, are you going to like, I'm going to bribe the kid with ice cream? What are you going to do? You're not even going to say a word to that kid. You're going to run over there, grab that kid, hold that kid for dear life, and you're going to run with all your might and get in the house and save the kid. This is what the Holy Spirit does. He comes to encapsulate you. He comes to bear hug you. He's going to hold on to you. The Holy Spirit has joined your human spirit. And he affirms that we are God's children. And that's what he wants you to know. He wants you to know how crazy he is about you. Now think about this. He loves you so much that he is willing to put himself inside of you even though you're not perfect and even though you're like working through your gunk and junk and putting deeds to death. He's so crazy about you 
that he put himself inside of you to guide you, to lead you, to help you. But he's really also wanting you then to live by that spirit so that every day, all day long, every day of your life, you will change the environments that you go into. And so the spirit of God inside of you is not a lake. It's a river. It's a rushing stream. It's a rushing river through you. And so these are the eight, and I want to ask you to look on these and pick one. You can't, you can't do them all. Pick one. What's next for you? What, what's next? Next Sunday, out at Honeyman Island Beach, we got beach baptisms. If you've never been baptized into Christ, that's next. H have you ever given your life to Christ? That's first. You, you say, I, I, I want to surrender. I want the Spirit inside of me. So I want you to look on that and just sit here quietly for just a minute. We've talked about winning the day. And we're going to talk a lot about this come, come February and March. But we talk about winning the day and we thought, I, I kind of broke that down and I said, I'm not sure that I can like think to win the year. It's just so large. I'm not sure I can think about winning the month. I'm not sure I can think about winning the week. I, I'm just trying to win the day. I, I want you to think about that with life in the Spirit. What would your life be like if just one hour of every day you were all in? W one hour. You thought about this, you concentrated on this, that the Holy Spirit's remaining on you, just like Jesus, the Holy Spirit came down in the form of a dove and it remained on him. What if just one hour? I could just see somebody tomorrow at work going, what'd you learn at church? The pastor said, I'll have to live for Jesus one hour a day, one hour. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is break this down. So this afternoon, carve out one hour Go to the beach, go to the park, sit at home, turn the TV off, turn social, social, shut down social media. Just for one hour. Maybe you're at home, maybe you're out and about. Tomorrow then, on your phone, schedule, okay, from here to here, I got a lot of meetings. From here to here, I got a lot of challenging phone calls from here to here. I got to respond to this conflict, this challenge, but I'm going to be all in. I'm going to be a hundred percent dialed in, all in where the spirit of God is going to be all, all over me. You see, I, I don't know that you can think long-term with this. It's so massive, but just start small. Just today, this afternoon, one hour, I'm going to the restaurant. I'm going to tip well. I'm going to honor the waitress. One hour tomorrow at work. I usually respond this way at work, but I'm going to one hour, just one hour today and one hour tomorrow. And go from there. See how you're going to feel when the Spirit of God is telling you what is yet to come. Your life's not going to be worse off your life will be so much better off. And don't misunderstand me. I know he's asking us to live by the Spirit 24-7 all the time. I, I'm just breaking this down, giving you a, an exercise that I think you can, you can handle. What's next? What, what will you do? The two angels said to the apostles, why are you standing here? Let's giddy up and go. There's ground that needs to be taken. There's ministries that need to be fulfilled. There's folks that need to be loved on. There's folks that just need to be forgiven. 
There's folks that need to be, there's people that need to be invited to, to church. There's conversations you need to have. You, you may need to go to somebody and just ask for forgiveness. Or God may bring somebody into your life and give you a blessing and you're going, that was from him. I didn't miss it. I didn't miss it. That was from him. I'm going to ask the prayer.